next for a conversation on climate policy and carbon emissions in the U.S. and abroad. Let's bring in Hal Harvey, the CEO of Energy Innovation. Hi, Hal. Greetings, Ron. How are you? Good, good. Let's see. Is your, are you on? Yes, there you go. Um, so, you know, we, we asked Secretary Moniz at, at the outset um, whether climate change was making us more susceptible to pandemics like this. Can I start by asking you the opposite, the inverse question? Uh, what do you think this pandemic is doing to our ability to respond to climate change? Well, one hopes that what it would begin to, we would begin to take it serious, take climate change a little more seriously. The world's economy grinded to a halt with this tiny uh, pandemic, uh, these little cells. Um, climate change uh, promises to be much worse and over a much longer time scale, but with quite different consequences. It will hit different regions at different times. So one of the things we have to do is make sure that the recovery that we, that we create out of this is a green recovery. In other words, we should be alert to the possibility that things can change radically and rapidly. And if we don't begin to think about prevention instead of mop up, we'll be in pretty deep trouble. Uh, talk about that in terms of, I mean, do you see the recovery as an opportunity to accelerate, I mean, the transition to a green economy? Certainly there are gonna be tremendous uh, need to create jobs coming out of the largest uh, de uh, unemployment since the depression here and uh, presumably in most countries around the world. It's certainly a huge opportunity, but only if we grasp it. Uh, the Europeans are planning something they call the Green Deal, nothing new about it. They will commit uh, over a trillion dollars to this, um, and it's already been supported by more than half the member states. It's not been passed into law yet. And this morning, I just went through the Chinese uh, stimulus numbers. They're devoting over $2 trillion to a green recovery. What's important about this is you're building the capital stock that sets future energy consumption patterns. Mm -hmm. Capital stock has long turnover time, cement plants, power plants, the car fleet, the truck fleet, refrigerators, buildings especially. So if you want to bend the curves on their carbon emissions, you have to start today. And we have this massive influx of cash to the economy. We can purchase, we can make these investments for tomorrow or we can squander the money for today. And that's a, it's a fundamental choice that we have not yet landed on here in America. Um, I don't think anybody would look at this last few months and say it has been a model we're going to be studying in 50 years on international cooperation, <laughs> dealing with a global challenge, you know, more likely the opposite. I'm interested in what, what, what you think, if anything, this tells us about the ability or the requirements, really, the preconditions that are necessary to get the world to cooperate on something as big as climate change. Well, the first thing one has to do is recognize that there are some international negotiations and agreements that are zero sum games, who gets which piece of territory. There are others which are positive sum games that both sides win and win big if they work together. And clearly the uh, COVID pandemic is a positive sum game. In other words, it's better for everybody if every country has a smart program, if we uh, pool knowledge on developing a vaccine, um, if we think about uh, the restructuring of the travel industry and so on together. The same is emphatically true with climate change. There's no one country that can solve it, although the US can do as much as anyone. But we, in fact, depend on China to do their part. They depend on us. We both depend on Europe and the Middle East and so forth. So that's, that's the first part, is, is, is begin to think about the, the nature of the solution, which should then lead to a political response. You know, we, we have a lot of questions, as we did for Dr. Moniz, around the theme of how the world changes after this, the ways the world changes after this, and whether that will uh, improve or lengthen the odds of our being able to make progress against climate. For example, Daniel uh, asks, what about the redesign of cities, towns, and how we live and the kind of spaces we create? <clears throat> Could that greatly reduce our, our, our energy consumption? And Paula uh, Rance asks, um, globalism requires the long distance transports of good. Has anybody measured the contribution uh, of, to climate change of the transport of products around the globe and whether if supply chains are brought, uh, are disrupted and, and brought more na national, uh, closer to, to home, whether that would reduce some of those pressures. I'm interested <clears throat> in responding specifically to those, but your, your broader thoughts on some of the pluses and negatives we might see of the way we respond to COVID-19 and how that will affect the climate fight. These are, these are great questions. Let me deal with the, um, the cities, the form of cities question first. One of the consequences of the pandemic is the streets are empty. 
uh, it's quieter out. Um, and mm -hmm. people are discovering that the streets can be used for more than just cars. Kids can play, you can ride a bike, you can get around more easily, you can take a nice long walk. And I think once people have a taste of what a city can, mm -hmm. can be like, they may demand more of it. I mean, think of it, when we, when we go on vacation, we like to go to cities we can walk and where we can sit at a sidewalk cafe. But at, we come back home and we forget all about that. That's a little bit crazy. So first, first point I would say is, let's remember the public spaces for all the public, not just the people that are sitting behind the wheel. Um, so so that's, there's a neat possibility mm -hmm. there. The, the question about supply chains, the energy in moving goods is relatively small because you can put so many TVs on a, on a, a ship mm -hmm. and, and send it across the ocean. Um, but there's a deeper question of embedded energy in the production of goods, which gets to the composition of whatever you're making, the washing machine, the bicycle, the toothbrush, uh, but also to the energy system from which it's imported. So some companies have started to demand that their supply chain get green, um, step by step by step, right? Uh, all the way from the mind mouth to the consumer. And the bigger, better ones have had a huge influence, a significant influence, not nearly big enough, on uh, other countries and other suppliers. And I think making this a more vigorous push, including using national policy, would, would make a huge difference. You know, to your point about uh, kind of the livability of cities, there's interesting data from the International Energy Agency. Overall, they, they project, I think, an 8% decline in, in emissions this year because of so many people staying at home and so much commerce uh, being disrupted. Uh, but in March, they said Paris saw a CO2 drop of 72% compared to normal, <laughs> much more than even New York, which is, which is heavily on lockdown. I'm just wondering what that says about the way energy is being used around the globe uh, and uh, you know, if there are lessons going forward. I mean, are, are, can we, in fact, can more cities kind of emulate the walkable cities, as you suggest? There's no question. When should, when the, the first place for action is in the countries that are building new cities like crazy. So China is going to add 300 million people to its cities in the next 25 or 30 years. In other words, one USA. The current topology of Chinese cities is based on the old Soviet model of single use super blocks, huge blocks surrounded by enormous boulevards. That's a recipe for a permanent traffic jam. And in fact, there was a 60 mile traffic jam in Beijing that took 11 days to unravel. The alternative is a much more porous, smaller street network like Barcelona or parts of San Francisco. Um, and then giving significant elements of that to public transit so that it's faster than cars rather than slower, exclusive lanes for buses, for example, but also giving it back to the people uh, in the form of micro mobility. If you get on an electric bike, the hills flatten, long distances become short distances, and you've created a fantastic mobility machine and electric bikes are booming. I spent six weeks in Paris recently teaching and the mayor there, Annie Hidalgo, has made, I think, 300 kilometers of exclusive bike paths. And mm. Everyone's riding bikes. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you, our, our next guests are our international focus. So let, let, let's dig into U.S. politics for a minute. Yeah. You know, I've written about the tendency of the energy producing states at this point to overwhelmingly send to Congress, uh, to the Senate, uh, Republicans, uh, who almost universally oppose any legislative action on climate change. If you look at the 20 states with the most per, per, uh, per dollar, with the highest carbon emissions per dollar of economic activity, the 20 states with the most, they have 40 Senate seats, obviously 35 of them are Republican senators. Trump carried, uh, I believe, all but one of those 20 states. As long as we have this kind of division where the energy producing regions are sending to Washington politicians resolutely opposed to action on climate. What is the way forward in the U.S. toward greater action? Is there a legislative pathway or is this something that's going to have to be done at the state level and through the executive branch at the federal level? So the first thing to remember is the states actually control most energy decisions in America already. They always have. They set the utility structures. They regulate the utilities. Mm -hmm. They determine transportation patterns. Um, they create building codes. They can set appliance standards in many cases, and they can also begin to set efficiency standards for cars, although that's being challenged by the Trump administration. So there are now 45 governors with clean energy pledges covering 55% of America. 
Um, so the transition is underway. The US CO2 emissions are generally going down, not fast enough to be sure. Um, and there's a boom in wind and, and solar. I should also add that two thirds of all renewables put in America have, been, have landed in red states with Texas mm -hmm. being the leader. Mm -hmm. So when you go home, the rhetoric calms down. When you talk to a governor, you get a different conversation than when you talk to a senator. I think what's happening in Washington and it's tragic is that there are these sort of articles of faith that you have to subscribe to, to be a member in good standing of the Republican party that have nothing to do with economics or human health or the environment. But to button up the point before we let you go, can the US get to where it needs to be and can it lead the world to where it needs to be without a national commitment and a national plan? Uh, we would be far better with a national commitment and a national plan. If we squander this moment, if we squander US leadership, political leadership, and if we squander our ability to innovate and compete, uh, we are doing this country a grave disservice. And that's what's unfortunately in the federal agenda today. Yeah. Hal, Harvey, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your thoughts and your insights.